So I just made a very short introduction in Norwegian, uh, why I was invited to come and uh, talk with you. Um, and um, Benjamin Pogren, we know that um, uh, you have lived, uh, you are born in South Africa in 1933. Correct. A very fatal year in the history of Europe. It was the same year as uh, Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany. And um, when we must say the big catastrophe that uh, has been so um, uh, terrible for Europe and for the whole world uh, was uh, uh, in its beginning uh, in the year 1933. Um, but you, uh, your family had come to South Africa before that. You were born in South Africa. And can you please tell us a bit about your family background, where sure. your family came from, and uh, why you, your family ended up in South Africa? Well, there was quite an immigration of Jews from Lithuania from the beginning of the 20th century. In fact, the Jewish community in South Africa today, which is about 70,000, probably 90% are from Lithuania. And my parents were among those who came in the 1920s. And that was very really fortunate for me because I grew up very conscious of my family in Lithuania, especially during the war years. Um, during my lifetime, I can remember two occasions on which my father was crying. And the one occasion, as a young boy during the war, when he got news that the last of our family had been murdered. So I lost all my uncles on my father's side, my cousins, everyone like that. I never met them. They were wiped out. I actually have in one of my books, I found the SS report, which recorded the actual day in the village where my family lived in Rakashik, in Lithuania, the day they were taken out, marched a few kilometers down the road to the forest and shot and buried there. So I grew up with this in this very racist South Africa, very conscious of the effects of racism. It, it impinged very strongly on my life. So if your family had not, or your father, uh, if your father had not immigrated to South Africa, if you had remained in uh, Lithuania, you would have ended up in that mass grave in 1941 or 42, something 41, like that. 41, yeah. 41 already. December, 41, yeah. yes. Yes. Correct. So that must have been really to think about that in your uh, youth. Yeah. It must have been a terrible paradox. Tremendously so. And over the years, it's of course caused me to study the Holocaust in great detail and also uh, communism, because I've been interested, and also living in South Africa, I've been very interested in manifestations of authoritarianism and totalitarianism. I'm just, I'm still baffled why people have been able to do what they do to other people. In fact, I've been thinking lately that the next book I write is gonna start off that I think most of my life has been spent in writing about terrible things being done by terrible people to other people. That seems to have characterized my life, uh, certainly in South Africa. And in the Middle East, it's also not so pleasant these days either, as you know. But I've grown up very much under that shadow of domination, of wanting to know how people like Hitler and Stalin gain power and keep in power. What terror do they use? And how they dehumanized human beings. That's right. Which uh, justified killing them. That's right. Well, in South Africa, of course, just to come back to that a moment, I think it was the London Times that years ago um, coined the phrase, I think it was an, uh, a non-beings about the way black people were treated in South Africa. They didn't exist. And in fact, if I may jump ahead a moment, that's what caused me to go into journalism. Um, when I grew up in South Africa, uh, there are two groups of papers, uh, English language and Afrikaans language. The, the Dutch speaking. Dutch speaking. From the Dutch, yeah. yes. Yeah. And um, the Dutch, of course, didn't bother at all. But on the English side, as I grew up, blacks did not exist in the white newspapers. The only time you read about black people in the white newspapers was in times of riots, which there were regularly, and you'd have a report the police last night shot six natives who were throwing stones or something like that. Or in mining accidents, a lot of them are the gold mines, hundreds a year. 
and there'd be a report, a white mine worker, Mr. van der Merwe, and six natives, no names ever, were killed in a rock fall last night. Uh, criminal cases, criminals, you'd have the names. Occasionally you might have a paragraph about a black leader saying something. And I grew up with this, and increasingly I began to wonder, why is this? And I went into journalism, as someone shouldn't go into journalism, as you'll know, with a mission. <laughs> I was a missionary to report the existence of 80% of the people of South Africa. And luckily, when I joined the Rand Daily Mail, there was an editor, Lawrence Gander, who had taken over only months before, who happened to share the same belief. So I was able to do work that it would not have been possible on any other paper at any other time in South Africa to start reporting black people as people. And that was the fundamental contribution of the Rand Daily Mail to South Africa. But you told me before the meeting that your father, he was maybe not so happy with what you are doing because he had come from Europe, he was a, a Jew, he had escaped the Holocaust, yeah. and he got refuge in South Africa. He was received by the whites in South Africa. But still there was a lot of anti-Semitism yes. among the whites in South Africa. Correct. So you were in a quite, uh, in spite of the fact that you were white, you were in a, in a, in a uh, uh, somewhat special position. Well, in fact, until about 1948, the Afrikaner nationalists, who were the majority people, uh, about 55, among whites, 55% Afrikaner, 45% English, um, but some Afrikaners were against apartheid anyway. Um, they tended to view Jews as aliens, uh, as non-Europeans. In '48, it changed when they got into power because they needed the they needed every white they could lay hands of. But I've just I fact, re, re, been reading a history uh, about anti-Semitism in South Africa in the 1930s and 1940s, so it's been very much in my mind because there was a great deal of anti-Semitism a lot of feeling for Nazism among Afrikaners. And my father, over the years, as I was growing up and as a teenager, I got into student politics at the university. I, the government was imposing apartheid on the universities. I was in the forefront of student leadership fighting them. I went to the Rand Daily Mail. I was doing all this political writing. And my father used to say to me, why are you making such trouble? The Afrikaners were good to us. They led us into the country. And I had very fierce arguments with my father. And as I've got older and been reading these other books, I, I look back with some embarrassment because <laughs> my father had a point. But on the other hand, South Africa was very curious because taking the Jewish community, um, it, the number of Jews who opposed apartheid was out of all proportion to the size of the community. Jews were dominant in the struggle against apartheid. On the other hand, the Jews who made possible apartheid were out of all proportion to the size of the population because there were a lot of talented Jews in commerce and industry, very powerful in the economic sphere, and they supported apartheid basically because, let's say you were a factory owner, strikes by black workers were illegal. So if your workers went on strike, you simply called in the police, they cracked a few heads, end of strike. So that was it. You needed permits to get goods from overseas. So the Jewish community, the business community, supported apartheid, whether they, they disagreed with it, but through their activities, they necessarily supported it. So you had this dichotomy mm. in the Jewish community. But um, you knew Nelson Mandela. Oh yes, very well. So uh, that's quite unique, I think, to sit and talk with the person today who were yeah, familiar I, with Nelson Mandela. Could you, could you describe him? Sure. I met him first. Uh, I was first in the Liberal Party until I joined, which was a non-racist party, and I got to know him, and I was then a, a writer. I got to know him when he was a young lawyer. And uh, at that stage, I must tell you, he was the leader of the African National Congress in the Transvaal province, uh, but he was banned. Uh, banning was uh, something the government used the Minister of Justice, as he was called, would issue a decree that um, you were not allowed for the next five years or whatever it was 
um, to attend any meetings. Nothing you said could be printed or reported. You could not enter any university, school, or factory without permission. Often you had to remain within a suburb or the city, or sometimes 24-hour arrest, house arrest, at home all the time. So Mandela was banned, so technically he wasn't allowed to take part in the African National Congress. But the ANC didn't recognize us, and their policy was we stand by our leaders. So as leaders were banned, and they disappeared from public gaze, in fact they were still working behind the scenes, and that was Mandela's case. He was tall, good-looking, uh, very unusual for those days, he was an attorney, a lawyer. You could probably, at that time when he started, count the number of black attorneys on one hand in South Africa. He owned a motor car, which was unusual. He was very much a ladies' man. He had an image as a playboy, if you can believe that, although he was a very serious politician. There's a wonderful story uh, when he was doing his articles for a, a Jewish guy, in fact, uh, Lezerski or something like that, in Johannesburg, the, uh, the, the, the wife of the, of, the, of the lawyer told the story. She was at a bus stop one day waiting for a bus, and uh, Mandela drove by, and he stopped to offer a lift, and she was scared to get in the car because she wasn't sure if he'd stolen the car. <laughs> it was so unusual for a black man to own a motor car. <laughs> but um, he grew up, in fact, he was active behind the scenes, and I was seeing him, and we worked together on a number of places. Then he went underground. Uh, he was organizing a mass strike, uh, which wasn't called a strike, it was called a stay at home, because the strike was illegal. And he was operating underground. The whole of the police force were hunting him. Uh, there were two of us that I know of only, two journalists who were seeing him secretly. Um, I discovered later a message would be dropped at my office or else I had a way of dropping messages for him. And we'd meet so with the whole police force hunting for him, this tall, imposing man. He was wearing a worker's boiler suit, overalls. Uh, you know, as hardy a disguise, but he got away with it. And we used to meet in a dark corner of Johannesburg and sit for a couple of hours talking about his proposals. I'll tell you a story about this and why Never mind politics, why I love that man. The day of the strike came, and until then, I'd, uh, whenever there were mass protests, I'd do the township rounds, the ghetto townships where a couple of million blacks lived. And I'd be out there at two, three in the morning, touring round, uh, scared of both the mobs and the police. You were caught in between, the black mobs and the white police. Both of them want to kill you. and. Um, but by then I'd become so expert that the office held me back to put together all the reports from around the country to collate them, which I did. Then we decided to run a special edition. Normally we published at two o'clock in the morning, at eight o'clock in the morning. And unknown to me, and this is what happens on a newspaper, you've had experience, it's, it's not conspiracies, it's, it's cock up. People make mistakes. And without consulting me, the sub-editors grabbed the story because the government issued an announcement, strike has failed. Obviously they would say that. And the paper led with this banner headline across the front page. In fact, it wasn't true. What had happened was people were scared stiff. They were afraid because their employers had said to them, if you don't come to work, you're fired. They were scared that if they didn't go to work, they'd have trouble. If they went to work, the police would attack them because at the end of the day there was always violence. The gangsters would attack them. They were just terrified. So hundreds of thousands of black workers stayed back to see what was going to happen. So the strike started off very quietly. Once word went round that the Rand Daily Mail, which was totally respected in the black community, said strike has failed, the strike was over. People just poured to work. That was the end of the three-day strike. So there I was, I'd been sitting through the night, sitting in mid-morning at my desk feeling absolutely terrible. I knew we had wiped out whatever chance the strike had. And my phone rings, and there's Mandela's voice, warm, cheery voice. And I start stammering an apology. Nelson, I'm sorry we screwed up. You know what he said to me? He used to call me Benji boy. He said, it's okay, Benji boy. I know it wasn't your fault. 
Now, you can imagine that a man who's been working underground for months, his life on the line, and my newspaper has wiped him out that day, and he can say that to me. Now, how do you describe a human being like that? Mm-hmm. And um, you, were, you were also present at the Sharpeville massacre in 21st of March, 1960. Yeah. Can you describe this massacre is, uh, has become history? Yeah. One of the more turning points, I must say, in the struggle against apartheid, that where 69 people were killed. Well, and that, you, you were there. Yeah, that was um, uh, someone even closer to me than Nelson Mandela, Robert Sabukwe. And in fact, I've written his biography, and it's an interesting story in itself, because this book appeared, I wrote it 27 years ago. It's now in its third edition, and this year alone, there have been, up to June, two printings of it. And the reason is, he was Mandela's political rival. He's been totally eclipsed by Mandela. His organization, the Pan-Africanist Congress, just went into nothingness, uh, because he was in prison. But he was my close friend, and he was the one who called the anti-pass protest. He was a university teacher, and he called on black people to go to prison. Uh, Blacks carried a document called the pass, called the Dom Pass in Afrikaans, the stupid pass. It controlled their lives. It showed where they were allowed to be at any particular time, where they were allowed to work, where they'd pay their tax. And at any time, a policeman could simply say, pass, pass. Didn't have it on you? Immediate arrest. Looked at the past, didn't have the official stamp in it, you were allowed to be in Johannesburg to work? Immediate arrest. A million prosecutions a year on these passes. They were the most hated document in South Africa. They controlled black lives. So Sabukwe said to people, "Go, leave your pass at home, go to the nearest police station and offer yourself for arrest. And he said, I will not ask you to do anything that I won't do myself. I will go first. And that's what he did. It was magnificent, it was brave, it was also politically naive because his organization was less than two years old, it had no leadership capability, it had no depth, so that's why the Pan-Africanist Congress just dwindled away. But Sabukwe went to prison that day, and it was, I was with him, I, went to see, I was with him when he went to prison on his way and so on, then I heard there was shooting elsewhere, so I drove across, and that's when I went into Sharpeville. And um, I was there when the shooting was happening, uh, I didn't get any pictures, uh, or anything like that, because a moment after the shooting, uh, I was with a photographer, I was attacked by a crowd. And uh, I, uh, my nickname on my newspaper used to be the riot consultant, because I covered so many riots. And you know, when you have a crowd, in a split second it becomes a mob, and it's very different. And I was as close to dying that day as I ever have been, because a moment after the shooting stopped, and the bodies were all over the ground, I got attacked by the crowd. And my car was a write-off, it was smashed so, up. So even if your paper supported the black didn't movement? Didn't matter, no one knew I, I was white. Yeah. Before the shooting, I was sitting out in the open, in the middle of the crowd, and once people knew I was from the Rand Any Mail, they wanted to tell me their troubles, mm-hmm. about the passes, about poverty, about all <coughs> the, the housing problems, they were talking to me. But once a shooting happened, I say the crowd became a mob in an instant, and a mob is just blind. Mm. And I was there. I was a white person in a car. They went for me. And the shooting from the police was, of course, I guess you could have been caught up in that too? Well, I was just on the edge of it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sure. No, I was lucky. But Sabuka went to prison, and he did three years uh, in jail for incitement, it was called. And then uh, they were so afraid of him, they passed a special law of parliament called the Sabukwe Clause to give them the power to keep him in prison indefinitely. And he was kept in prison for six years. And then he was banished and banned to the town of Kimberley. And then he died of cancer. So the last 18 years of his life were lived in captivity of one sort or another. Mm. I was allowed to visit him on the island, by the way, six times. So I saw him on the island and I, and in Mandela, um, I was the first non-family person allowed to see him uh, after about 
22 years, I think it was. And uh, that was curious because I wasn't allowed to see him as a journalist. I had to give the government a promise. I would not write a word about it. And I was deputy editor of my newspaper, and I had to go to my colleagues and say, I'm going to see Mandela on Saturday morning, and I cannot write a word about it. And my colleagues had to accept it. But I saw him as a friend. Hmm. And uh, we had a visit, which was an extraordinary visit. And then he wanted me to come back with my wife, Anne, who was there. And we had a double visit, a contact visit, hmm. a while later. He had a picture of Anne. He never met her. We got married after he was in jail. But he said he had a picture of her in his cell. He wanted to meet her. Hmm. But if we go back to, let's say, 1975 or something like that, did you uh, think that apartheid would last forever? That yeah. that would be the, your destiny in a way? Yes. Yes. No, it seemed unending. And... Um, when the, my newspaper was closed down in ni 1985, um, we were the leading voice against apartheid. And uh, the government hated us. Um, the trouble is our management turned against us. And when the management turned against life had been very difficult fighting the government. With your management also, we were lost. And uh, although it's still a secret, uh, never been confirmed, my absolute belief, which I, I, I wrote in a book also, a deal was done behind the scenes between the government and the owners of the Rand Daily Mail to close us down. And the price, the price was um, commercial television was starting in South Africa, and the newspaper industry was desperate. They were afraid of the advertising, and a deal was done that the new television service was handed to the newspaper industry to run. Hmm. And that saved the, the newspapers. And that, to, that, to my knowledge, is how the deal was done. So we were done in. So that was 1985. And at that stage, I despaired. I saw apartheid stretching out all the way of the rest of my life. I couldn't see any end to it. It was so powerful in deep, deep, deep. And... Um, so we left, we emigrated, Britain gave me sanctuary, and then I ended up in Israel eventually. Um, but there's a wonderful Afrikaans phrase. I find Afrikaans words very similar in Norwegian. I didn't understand what you were saying earlier, but I read the newspapers and I can mm. understand quite a bit, I think. Keiku Lekel and No, see how they look now. Mm. So from 1985, my total despair, and within eight years, it had gone, nine years. And that's an important story, an important lesson in history. It's an important lesson for the Middle East. Something which is unimaginable. It's so in, entrenched, so rooted, can't end. Like Nazism in 1941, 1942. Mm. Who would have thought within three years it will all be over? Other events came in. And in South Africa's case, it was the end of the Soviet Union. That was the changing point for South Africa. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so, but you told me before the meeting that um, the Rand Daily Mail where you worked was an opposition, uh, the main opposition uh, mouthpiece for in South Africa for the anti-apartheid uh, anti struggle. But it was not so easy to be a Jew even there. <laughs> I personally never had any difficulties that I was aware of. Perhaps I was insensitive, I don't know. Because reading this book, uh, as I was doing last week, about the history of anti-Semitism, I've been absolutely astonished at the depth of anti-Semitism in the 1920s and 30s. When the Afrikaners came in, I was a teenager, and I can remember the fear that swept through the Jewish community. The Afrikaans, I just have to explain, you know, the Dutch, the people with Dutch origin who came to South Africa in the 1600s. Yeah. yeah. And they, they won the election in 48 on the slogan of apartheid, uh, separateness, uh, Afrikaans word, and the world was astonished. Three years off the end of the Holocaust, you have a government elected which believes in race, race discrimination. If I can, I've got two copies of something here, you might just want to uh, pass around and I'll explain it. 
I'll just get up and just explain this. If you wouldn't mind just passing, glancing those two pages and passing them around and explain things to you. The basis of apartheid was called the Population Registration Act in 1950, which set out to put every single South African into a racial pigeonhole. And you were defined by your color. And this determined your status in life because everything good was for the whites and then there was a pyramid, Asians and coloreds, and then blacks who were 75, 80% of the population at the bottom. And you were assigned numbers. That's the one for, blacks had their own tribal numbers. But on that one, um, what I've set, put around there are the, are the codings. So I was South African born white, so I was zero, zero. If I was born in England and white, I'd have been zero, one zero, I think it was. And you see it goes down the scale, and attached to it, by the way, is the birth certificate of my son, who's defined as a white person. Um, and it goes down the scale, colored, Malay, all sorts of things. But because people are not, you can't just put all of us into a neat racial pigeonhole, there were two categories for the sort of in-betweens. And you'll see one says other colored. So if you weren't colored or black or white, you could be an other colored or an other Asian. And what they did was they formed population registration boards because there were borderline cases. That's what they were called. Were you black? Were you white? Were you colored? Were you Asian? And coloreds especially were desperate to be defined as white because they got the privileges. So the population registration boards would sit, there were about three or four men, and you'd appear before them. And the, the qualifications changed, but they went through mad stages. At one time they decided that the, your hair showed what color you were. The more crinkly your hair, the, the c more colored you were. So they used to put a pencil through someone's hair, and if it got stuck because it was crinkly, you were colored. They also had a theory I never quite understood about, the, about the, f the fingernails, about the moons of your fingernails, that in some funny way, this showed what color you were. Well, you had tragic stories. You had brothers and sisters separate, a light-skinned sister who passed for white and a darker-skinned brother who was colored. And they'd stay away from each other because otherwise a neighbor would phone the police and say, she's not really white, she's colored. It determined basically where you were born, which nursery school you went to, if there was one, which school you went to, which determined the quality of your education, because white education was by far the best. Black education generally was dreadful. Still the effects today. That, to me, is the unforgivable thing the Afrikaners did. They destroyed yes. black minds and black education, and you're still paying for it today. What work you could do, which meant what income you had, what your university, whom you could marry, whom you could sleep with, and finally, where you were buried. It determined your life from life to death, that one little number in that coding. Oh. That's how apartheid was put into, into operation. Oh. And from that flowed a mass of laws which determined every aspect of life. But as a Jew, could you have become a editor-in-chief of oh, a newspaper? <laughs> no, uh, it was an unspoken tradition, because however much our management hated us, we were still the jewel in the crown of this c quite a big company. Uh, historical reasons for that. And it was an unspoken tradition that no Jew could become editor of the Rand Daily Mail. Um, and eventually, a uh, fellow Gordon Waddle who was the boss of the company owning the, uh, working for the real parent company, which uh, Anglo-American in South Africa, a giant company. Uh, Gordon, whom I knew, was a very nice fellow. He was a rugby player. And he said to me very openly, uh, you can't be editor because you're a Jew. <laughs> it was as simple as that. <laughs> so, but to me, the miracle was that I was deputy editor because mm. I knew the board of directors didn't like me. I had friends that were unusual, Mandela and Subukwe, this wasn't usual for a white South African, especially a journalist. So the mere fact of being deputy editor, because the country was st very strange. 
Uh, you had the most evil, terrible things happening there. And yet strange kindnesses and reaching across the color lines uh, in very strange ways. It's uh, good that we can uh, smile today about oh. everything oh, that it's happened. Evil. I have no regrets. You know, look, South Africa is yeah. a mess today. Yeah. There's corruption, there's cronyism, and I go there regularly and I, I both cry and I uh, and scream with fury because uh, there are millions of people whose dreams have gone unfulfilled, whose children's dreams are going unfulfilled because of the corruption and the incompetence. But still, to talk about uh, any regret about apartheid gang is just, you can't. It was just so totally evil. Mm. It just doomed people. Um, I, was, I was blessed because the friends I had, Mandela, Sabukwe, I knew all the other great people, black people and white people who fought against apartheid. And it was, it was a pressure cooker. It either destroyed you or it made you immensely strong. And we had some wonderful people, and there still are wonderful people in that country. They really, it's an extraordinary country. Yeah, I'm sure of that, but of course, everyone are happy that apartheid is a thing of the past. But everyone also asks how a wonderful person like Nelson Mandela could have been succeeded by a person like Jacob Zuma. It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <coughs> look, it's rotten at the moment, it really is, it's by any standard, uh, these are gangsters. And, but it's slowly at the moment getting cleaned out. And also, I know the history of the African National Congress very well, and it's been an extraordinary liberation movement, there's nothing like it. It got started in 1912, and for years <coughs> they were asking the whites, please give us some rights, please, please will you pleading with them. In the, during the First World War, they sent a delegation to England to see the King of England, to ask him please to help them against the whites, which of course was nonsense. And then it got eclipsed in the 1920s by other organizations, in the 1930s, in the 1940s. It's gone up and down like that. And yet it's always been Congress. It's had a hold on people's feelings and beliefs. And that's its enduring strength. And it's always been raucous and broken and corrupt inside, all the years I've known it. Uh, it's very much a people's, popular people's movement. And it's done some terrible things. I mean, during the, the exile years, the ANC behavior in its guerrilla training camps, uh, the stories are, are, are hair-raising. They were just murdering each other. And uh, it was Soviet-style stuff. <coughs> the communists had too much influence. That was one of the problems. But I believe in the ANC ultimately, because it is a people's movement. And I can see signs at the moment. The things are coming into the open now that hadn't come into the open before. One of the tragedies is the press. Under apartheid, we had some very <coughs> gifted journalists, but they had us by the throat. There were laws which either forbade us to publish, like the Defense Act, couldn't publish a word, police, nothing about the police, or laws which made us take the decisions, like um, incitement to violence or incitement to racial hostility of all things. So you'd have a story and you'd have to decide in six months time what sort of magistrate or judge would you get, what would be the climate at the time, how safe would it be to publish. We were lucky we had wonderful lawyers and the Rand Daily Mail was also important because we pushed as far as we could. Because the normal journalism rule, as you'll know, is when in doubt, leave out. We'd go to our lawyers and we'd say, if I take out that sentence, what are the chances? If I just change that word, what are the chances? It was always an editorial decision, ultimately. Once a lawyer said, well, we think you've got a 50-50 chance of getting away with it, we'd say, okay. 50% mm -hmm. was usually what we wanted. And we usually got away with it. Not always. I got into a lot of trouble for things I wrote. But we pushed it all the way. And that's how a lot of information got out in that way. But increasingly, they were throttling us. Today, it's pretty open. A uh, large degree of press freedom. And you don't have competent journalists. 
Mm. There are a few, but not nearly enough. Mm. So that is a tragedy. When I go there, I just see the bad writing, bad editing, which is happening worldwide, of course, yeah. also, for other reasons. I, I totally agree that journalists were not like they were in, in my youth. We, we, no, we no, sound yeah. old, but in fact, yeah. it's true. Yeah. <laughs> I can prove all, it by All journalists you. agree on that. Yeah, that's that right, yeah. Everything was better than yeah. before. But, but all in all, you are optimistic about the future of South Africa. I wouldn't use the word optimistic. Uh, slightly hopeful. <laughs> and hoping like hell that it'll work out. Because mm. there's such wonderful people in that country, and I, and I put so, so much of my life is there. Um, I want to see it come right. I feel sorry for those poor sods. I mean, I was asking uh, poverty in Norway. You don't know what it is. If you've been to Africa, to Southern Africa, you'll know what poverty is. Uh, America, they talk about poverty. They don't know what it means. It's all relative. That's real poverty, that's starvation. I wrote the first reports years ago about starvation in South Africa. No one knew it even existed. The government called me a liar. Called them un they used to sneer at my newspaper. We were called the Hungersnot Courant, the, the uh, malnutrition newspaper. It was a sneer, yet it's there. Uh, poverty with people who've got just about nothing to live on means crime. Someone's got no hope at all. What does he do? Starts robbing. Mm -hmm. Resistance kills. It's a psychopath. Just looks at you, smile and pulls the trigger. Mm -hmm. Guns are rampant. Carjackings, which I thought had gone down when I was there, I was there last month, gone up 50% in the last four years. Uh, it's a terrifying phenomenon. Um, you've got to live with it. Mm -hmm. High fences, barbed wire, electronic gates, everything. Electronic gates are one of the danger points. As you pull up in your car, you make sure there are no bushes around because that's where the hijackers hide and they jump you. Or as you drive into your driveway, they run after you. Hmm. Any resistance, you get shot. Hmm. And the police are corrupt and rotten because the government's rotten and corrupt. But I believe it's, it can come right. Hmm. Well, no, we have been talking for um, at least 40 minutes. Uh, okay. So we have five minutes left for this part of the conversation. So are there anyone who has any questions in Norsk or English or what else? In English, if you don't in mind. In English. Well, in uh, any language, I <laughs> anyway, said. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, please, yes. <coughs> Hello. Yeah, <laughs> I I wonder uh, since in uh, South Africa today it's the the black government called. How is it the likely? Because I know some South Africans. I have friends, and I know that they said that actually the apartheid never end for them. The upper side. Yeah, apartheid. 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 Yeah, they, there wasn't end for them. Some some of the people. So I wonder, um, how does it affect it today? You mean apartheid hasn't ended for them? Yes. Or, uh, see, yeah. Um, what for, you've had, you've had a change. Size. A lot of black people uh, have become middle class, have got, uh, become very wealthy. Uh, a lot of them through their own talents. There's some enormously talented people um, who've now had a chance to develop and to gain real lives. Um, uh, my son happens to uh, work in the field of business ethics. That's what he teaches and he uh, fosters. And through him, I meet people, black businessmen. And they're, they're just superb human beings who'd be outstanding in any society. Um, there is still racism there. It's too deep embedded to take a long time to get rid of. Uh, mixed race coloreds complain in the Cape that they discriminated against. Um, these are difficult issues. Indians are nervous, but they, they're doing well, they're doing well in government. On the, on the surface, the, what Desmond Tutu called the Rainbow Nation, it's not quite true anymore. It's been tarnished too much. And the worry is, with all these socioeconomic troubles, it opens the way to populism, to people using this uh, to try and gain power, and they use racism, and they're talking against whites, and that's very dangerous. 
because that could blow that country apart. Because under apartheid, to me always the astonishing thing was, despite the repression, despite what blacks were suffering, I was amazed at how much contact and even love there was across the colour lines. I used to marvel at domestic servants, for example, blacks, who were deprived of their own children, they weren't allowed to have them in the cities, but would look after their white kids with total love and commitment. I used to be astonished by it. It was in a, It's something about black people in South Africa. I don't want to talk in racial terms, but there's some humanity there, which is quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Okay, there was a question there. Uh, what about the unity among the people in South Africa? I mean, between the Bantu people and the original peoples, like the Sun people and the Hottentots, and also, what's the situation for the Jews in the country today? Yeah. The, the Sun people and the Zodna, they hardly exist. They're just remnants. They do, they, they're, they mean to organize themselves and say, look, we have rights, like in Botswana, neighboring South Africa, they're Bushmen living in the, in the desert. And they're trying to organize, and you've got, you've got them. But the Sun were really wiped out centuries ago. They're just remnants, pockets of them. They don't really count. They're part of the coloreds, really. Um, there is great unity, uh, but their political division's growing, um, as there must be. And you'll find uh, uh, most blacks still support the African National Congress, but they're losing because things are so wrong. There are strange factors at work. For example, uh, pensions. You've got a millions of blacks living in rural areas who get old age pensions. They get it from the government. But as far as they're concerned, they get it from the African National Congress. So it's known that people go around and say, look, you vote against the ANC, you lose your pension. <laughs> so these people are not all that well educated. They live in remote areas. Communication is not of the greatest. So comes the election, they vote ANC. So is that a political factor? <laughs> what is it? It's a combination of strange factors. It's a strange country with this extraordinary history of oppression. It's come through it incredibly. The, the, the violence, I mean, talking, you know, reverting to Israel for a moment, um, you never had uh, mass suicide attacks. Never happened. Not a single one. There were two that I can recall offhand of uh, bombings of attacking civilians. Because the ANC's policy, when they turned to violence um, in 1961, was to follow firstly the Gandhian principles, because Mahatma Gandhi had lived in South Africa and his imprint was there, non-violence. And the second one was a practical one. They said, if we attack the white civilians, they'll be so terrified, they'll never yield power. So the ANC, as a matter of policy, refrain from attacking white civilians. Military people, yes. Farmers in the border areas, yes. But white civilians, no. And that paid off in the long run, because whites were not frightened. Today, though, you have got some black leaders who are using the racial card, and that is, I find, scary to look at. <laughs>